Well, God's grace, his mercy, his peace, his alleluias are all yours through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray he opens our hearts and our minds as we hear his word. That word for today is the story of our Savior's transfiguration. We just heard that in Mark chapter 9. I'm going to add two verses from Matthew 17 because Matthew, as always, provides us with a little more detail. I'll begin reading at verse 5. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. So our text so far. Please be seated. We are emotional creatures, yes? I know I am. I know I get caught up sometimes in things that really don't make sense, certainly don't have any importance in my life. For instance, when the Lions win a playoff game for the first time since 1992, or when they lose a game that they were originally 17 points ahead on, as happened on January 28, 2024, neither one has any real effect on my life, right? So why do I get so wrapped up and emotional watching these games? Every touchdown, every pass, every sack, every one. Why, why am I passionately hoping for both teams to lose today? <laughs> we can talk about that after. So there were some interesting ideas on how that could happen uh, in last night's service. But we, I am an emotional creature. We are emotional creatures. Big things set us off. Little things set us off. We can be jubilant about things that are of little importance. We can feel the weight of a conversation that took place weeks ago. Peter, of course, was also an emotional human being. So we're gonna start talking about this glorious moment of Christ's transfiguration by first looking at the emotional state of Peter. Because Peter is a mess. (laughs) And I'll explain why. Six days earlier, Peter had declared Jesus to be the promised Messiah, mountaintop. Shortly thereafter, Jesus says some pretty tough words to Peter when Peter misunderstands what it means to be Messiah. When Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That's a deep valley. And now, still carrying that, now he's seeing something he can't even begin to understand. Jesus' appearance is transformed in a way that displays his heavenly glory, and Moses and Elijah are standing alongside. Can you imagine? No, you can't. (laughs) Neither can I. Now, Mark likely is writing from Peter's eyewitness account, and he tries to convey Jesus' appearance with these words when he says, and he was transfigured before them. His appearance was beyond, I'm sorry, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. In other words, there are no words. His appearance was beyond anything that Peter and James and John had ever seen. So we can assume before the transfiguration, Peter was both thrilled that the Messiah had come and still stinging from the words of Jesus, get behind me, Satan. He may be unsettled or confused, uncertain about his future. And now, now, as he stares in disbelief at what's happening before him, add to that things like, I'm guessing, bewildered, I'm not guessing terrified because Mark wrote that, overwhelmed, excited, profoundly confused. See what I mean? Peter is a mess. So now that you have a sense into Peter's condition at that moment, I'm going to ask you this. Do you ever feel like Peter? (laughs) Do you ever feel like a mess? Up one minute, down the next, the world throwing things at you that knock you off balance? Maybe it's a job that can be both exciting and overwhelming at the same time. Maybe the outcome of a football game is weighing on your mood the next day. Social media showing us snapshots of seemingly perfect lives of everyone else. Talking heads on TV and on the internet showing us all the worst things about the world. This leaves us confused and, let's face it, like Peter, a bit terrified at times. The world tosses us around emotionally. And then there are the collective things that I just mentioned, and also the things in our own individual lives. Hectic work life, hectic family life, health issues, money issues, relationship struggles. 
You know the list. <laughs> Hardly a day goes by when I don't talk to someone who is wrestling with a complicated mix of emotions that reflect what they're dealing with at the moment. That's true for all of our pastors on staff here and, and our other workers as well. So Peter is a mess, and we, we who struggle collectively in this world, this broken world, we who are sinful, we are also a collective mess. We need assurance, we need peace, we need an encounter with our God. And here it is, on that glorious and terrifying day of transfiguration, God the Father in voice, Jesus our Savior in presence, the Holy Spirit in the cloud, all come to Peter and James and John, and today the triune God comes to us as well, through God's word, with three simple statements, words of instruction, words of command, words of promise. Listen to him. Rise up. Fear not. Peter sees this moment, Jesus in his glory, Moses and Elijah alongside, and, and he decides they're going to stay a while. We're going to build some tents for them. No doubt James and John had some ideas too about what was going to happen. They had thoughts, they had plans for this dynamic trio to shake up things in Israel. This is the day of the Lord, the time has come. God knows their minds and their hearts. He sees the confusion in their thoughts and emotions. And so he speaks instructions to them, the words they need to hear the most. This is my beloved son, listen to him. Do you want to clear your head? Listen to Jesus. Do you want to survive in the confusion and the chaos of this world? Look to the Savior. Hear what he says. See what he does. You know, this broken world that we're all a part of, it still impacts each of us differently, doesn't it? The messages that, the messages that we get, the, the, the experiences we have, they impact us differently. We're not like the Borg on Star Trek, all connected to one central mind, thinking the same thing. And yes, we were overdue for a Star Trek reference. But we are a spiritual community made up of individuals. And yet, we are connected intimately by the Holy Spirit through a common faith, through a trust in Jesus Christ. On that, we deeply agree. On that, we can say yes. We desire together to know our God. And God says, do you want to know me? Look to Jesus. Do you want to know God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Look to Jesus. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus individually in groups, all together in worship. Trusting that as we keep trying to listen to Jesus, seeking him in this noisy, noisy world, the Holy Spirit will help us to understand, to become closer to become more like him. Listen to Jesus. And as we do that too, we receive his gifts. The gift we all seem to need the most, especially the gift of his peace. And if we look at John 14, 27, Jesus points out that the peace he gives is the opposite of what the world gives to us. Man, we need that. So the first word, that word of instruction, listen to him. And now the second word, the command, rise, rise up. Now before you think this is something that you do on your own, look at this here. This is the Greek verb, egero. Matthew uses here, in this, in this verse, is the same as the one he uses in chapter 28 at Jesus' tomb, when the angels tell the women, he is not here, he has been raised. So it's more along the lines of, be raised up, and even be resurrected. It literally means awaken. Awaken. So back on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Jesus approaches the disciples, who have fallen on their faces in absolute terror, having heard the voice of God, he says to them, awaken. Not just physically, but put aside the things you know of the world. Put aside your incorrect notions about what the Messiah is supposed to do and be. Rise up to new life in me. Awaken 
to the reality that the kingdom of God has come and that you are part of that kingdom. That is your home. Those words for us too today. Awaken. Be raised up. Open your eyes to see who you truly are in Jesus Christ. Rise up from the distractions of this world and take your place in the kingdom as heirs, as saints, as children of God. Now, if we could truly do that, every single day, if we could remember our baptisms, dwell on the truth of who God has made us in Christ, remember that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If we could awaken and rise up like that, how would we look at the troubles in our lives? How would our approach to solving problems, to handling the difficulties of life, how would that all be different? So the instruction, listen to him. The command, rise up. And now the third word, the promise. Have no fear. Fear not. So simple, so needed, so difficult. I'm sure the disciples said, yeah, right. We, we just witnessed the glory of God. We heard his voice. We're shaking with fear. And Jesus says to us, fear not. But what he's saying in words is one thing. But watch how he says it with his actions. Matthew 17, 7 says, but Jesus came and touched them. Fear not. I'm here. Fear not. I am with you. His presence says that. Fear not. You know, some of you may know that Thursday night we had a fire here at Our Shepherd as a motor was spewing flames in the boiler room. The lower level is full of Boy Scout leaders, the choir loft is full of choir members, and they smell smoke. And there had to be some fear involved. I know I would have been afraid had I been here at that moment. But quickly, two Our Shepherd members found the problems, found the flames, grabbed a fire extinguisher and emptied it to put that fire out. And of course, the fire department was called and they came, they assessed the situation, and then they went out to all the people who were waiting outside and said, it's all clear. And the choir members came back inside and finished their rehearsal upstairs. Their fear was gone. Why? They were fearful before. Why aren't they fearful now? Well, it's because they were in the presence of someone who knows what to do, someone who's got it under control. And there was trust there. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, fear not. We are in the presence of someone, the greatest of all someones, who knows exactly what to do, who promises he has it all under control. He doesn't promise it'll be easy. In fact, he promises we will have trouble. But at the same breath, he says, I've got this. The world is mine. You are mine. Have peace. Have peace. Fear not really are two very simple words that form the very heart of the gospel. We do not fear the greatest enemy of all, death. Because Jesus Christ has gone through the cross to the tomb, through the tomb to his throne, and from that throne he will return and bring us all to be with him. And to us, as we sit in the middle of our fears and all of our anxieties, God says, I am God. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I am the past, the present, the future. I am here always. Be not afraid. We can, we can recognize together and separately too that our walk in this world is not going to be an easy one. And at the same breath, by God's grace, we can trust him. We can be certain of his presence. We can rest in his promises. We know we will not have a life totally free from fear in this broken world, but we also draw strength from the understanding that God did not create us for death. He created us for life. And through the power he provides by his spirit, we can move forward with courage, with confidence. That's what Jesus did. 
on that mountaintop. He moved forward with courage and with confidence. I would imagine that in his human flesh, Jesus was tempted to stay there in his glory, in fellowship with Moses and Elijah, but he did not. He descended that mountaintop, he encouraged his disciples, and then he set his face to Jerusalem towards suffering, towards certain death on the cross of Calvary. No matter what emotions Jesus was facing, and as a fully human man, he faced all the emotions that we do. Jesus did the three things that we just heard today. Jesus listened to his heavenly Father, he rose up, and he overcame the fear that he had to be feeling. This is our Savior, our King. He is tough, he is fierce, he is the Lion of Judah. This is the God who could not be turned back. This is the God who entered the place of greatest suffering and torment for you and for me. This is the God who not only went to the cross, but stayed on that cross, enduring unimaginable pain of both body and soul, until he was able to say, it is finished. And this is the God who holds you in the palm of his hand and promises that no one, no one, can take you from him. This is the God who places his hand on your shoulder and says, listen to me, rise up, fear not. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, amen. Please stand.